This week, we finally, finally, finally finish the AI for Magicians series. Now, it has been a few months since the last installment. And every time I sat down to put my thoughts together, something else would happen in the world of AI, or I'd realized, oh, I need to put that piece or that podcast out about the archons, about uh, some sort of digital technology. There were all these preambles. <laughs> there were all these other bits of information that needed to go into this initial foray of the actual and potential impact of AI in magic. So all well, of that's done now. This will not be the end of us looking at AI. And I don't just mean at Rune Soup, I mean in your life. Uh, and in fact, that's where the title for this week's episode comes from, I Would Cheat. And I learned this from Michael Malice was on some podcasts I listened to, it might have been Chris Williamson or something, uh, Rogan, I don't know, it doesn't matter, shilling his new book earlier in the year, The White Pill. And he was recounting a story of the time when Reagan was negotiating nuclear disarmament with Khrushchev and obviously famously Reagan and Thatcher were like this weird buddy cop film couple and Thatcher wasn't super behind the idea of trusting trust but verify but trusting that the Soviets would denuclearize she said what's stopping him from cheating I would cheat which is one of those things that she would say that's like yeah I, I, in fact, believe that. I believe that you would. The point here is one of the things that people compare AI to is nuclear technology in the sense that once it's been made, it can't be unmade. And the angle, the chaos magic angle we're going to go with is I would cheat, right? That's uh, we're somehow getting some inspiration from Margaret Thatcher. But it's, I want you to, by the end of the episode, think about the, your positioning and what I would cheat looks like because. AI is here, it's queer, it doesn't want any more bears. This is where we are in the world. And some of you, certainly not me, because lies detected, I'm still only 27. Uh, some of you may remember coming up in workplaces as more and more stuff went web-based. Some of you may remember contutors showing up in workplaces, but some of you may remember as things became more web-based, online ordering, booking, and so on, there were a bunch of people that are just like, no, nah, I don't like this. Dag nab it. And that's not the right move. It isn't necessarily the right move that you go, woo, AI, I'm all about AI. I'm going to do endless tweet threads about how other people are making money automating businesses with AI, and that will be my automated business. Woo! No, you need to kill yourself if that's you. But everyone else, there's the I would cheat angle. It's not going anywhere. So I guess to cut the presentation short in a way is, uh, is find your way into it. Okay, I would cheat. Here we are at the end of the year, which means we've been doing the AI examination for about eight months. Let's review uh, the year of our AI Lord 2023. From an artificial intelligence perspective, it was a year of maximum lunacy uh, and minimum efficacy. So the maximum lunacy reached its apogee recently. And this, again, if you are a creative, you will understand this. Why? Because I kept getting asked, like, when's the next AI episode out? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, I think they have to disappoint and annoy and dismay me more. Like, there's something that has to go on in the world <laughs> before I can let the final one drop. And what had to go on was several weeks ago, the outsting of Sam Altman as um, CEO of OpenAI. If you don't know, that's the... Uh, the ChatGPT non-profit fascist hybrid. And the reasons for his ouster and essentially immediate return are layered. On the one level, it's deep stupidity and self-absorption and self-obsession. So uh, effective altruism is a mind virus that infects the delusional midwits of Silicon Valley and around. It is this notion that, well, effective altru altruism, if you haven't heard of it, it's like, well, I'm going to, using my cleverness and my, um, my automation and my big data and stacks and tech, I am going to 
find the most effective place to intervene to have the most good show up in the world. So it, it means that you can kind of justify not helping out during a landslide because effective altruism would suggest that actually the best way of helping out is blah, 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 blankets in the next town over. It's not as ridiculous as that, but it's not far off. It's actually here. I know how the whole world works. <laughs> and because I am so good and so clever, I'm going to make these interventions. And it looks like half the board that tried to kick him out this, this whole, the people who are most scared of AI are the ones that are deep in it. And there, there is a real pseudo enchantment to this. It's tragic in a way that they're so stupid and their lives are so devoid of actual enchantment that they, they've basically built a little bit of software that they're scaring themselves with. When we were kids, my primary school actually was haunted, but not just that. We had a wonderful primary school teacher who unfortunately went on to commit suicide um not while we were there but like about 15 years later which i think about often that the guy he would ghost prank anyway the story for another time because he actually visited me after death uh so we had this primary school where there were stories of ghosts but it also was kind of haunted and that's a delightful combination for a 10 year old because you and your friends will effectively make up did you see that? That moved and that moved until you scare each other to death. <laughs> and then in one or two cases, we did get what I think, or at least remember as some odd poltergeist experiences as a result of that. But that's what these people are doing. They're doing what me, what me and my 10 year old friends did, which was to pretend that they saw a ghost or that there were ghosts and then scare themselves. Anyway, so that's the macro story of, uh, and he, he came back because most of the uh, organization, I keep, it's not really a company, whatever. Most of the organization was like, no, I'm not doing it. And they had a board change. And the board change is where I wonder if something more nefarious isn't going on because looking at the blended cycle model for 2023, depending on when you're watching this, of course, the forecast episode with Austin will be out uh, around Christmas. Merry Christmas. And if you're a premium member, we have the quarterly geopolitics presentation in the members area. But I put it at more than 60% that version one of a US CBDC rolls out. So who do we have on the board of uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI now? Uh, none other than a, a former central banker, Larry Summers. So it's already shot through with Google, which means it's shot through with the intelligence state and with Microsoft, same thing, right? And now we have an actual central banker on the board of ChatGPT at the end of a, what are you guys doing? This can't be the real reason for trying to get rid of him. So if you told me, oh yeah, that was all fake. Like that, that was a, some sort of flouncy counter move to shake off the demented cultists. Uh, these absolute midwit, midwit morons, just the, the dump, effective altruism, I, at least be Peter Thiel. Like if you're going to be in Silicon Valley, at least be like, no, it's uh, blood boys and libertarianism, right? You can defend that. That is at least robust. Effective altruism, get out. Get out. You are too stupid for the playground. Anyway, so unless it was some sort of very obvious feint to get the midwits off the board, you, and it could even be something more nefarious. It's like, well, actually, we're rolling out the CBD, CBDC next year, so we need to arrange a story. Who cares? No one's going to believe it anyway. So preposterous to get some central bank oversight onto what uh, OpenAI is going to be doing for 2024 because that's when we get version one of the CBDC. Do I have any evidence for that? I just have Larry Summers and a track history of being kind of right about this stuff. I'm not saying that's what it was. I'm saying if you told me that's what it was, I would not be surprised. So it was a year of maximum lunacy with everyone going, oh, it's going to destroy the world and having that idiocy shape up. And on the other side, minimum efficacy in terms of promise, like as I've got on the slide here, I still use it every day, but that's that famous Bill Gatesism. Uh, about we overestimate the impact of a technology on the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And I think we're certainly at the edge of that, oh, we overestimated the, the short term. So minimum efficacy is still efficacious. In, in real life, you're finding it 
the big, and it's a bit annoying, but in a few months it won't be the, the automation prompts in everything. So if you are responding to an eBay seller, if you're, I, I don't use Facebook, but I'm going to guess <laughs> uh, automated messages in Facebook chats. And so the, the autocomplete, it's like the next level up from autocomplete. You're not going to have Rosie, the robot butler. You're going to have even less exercise, like your thumbs aren't even going to need to work because the sad reality is you are sufficiently predictable that an AI can have both sides of a conversation to about 95% in e eBay, right? Like those conversations don't take a sharp left turn into asking someone's opinion of Immanuel Kant before um, how much are those USB-C cables that you're selling, right? So you're going to see it there. There's going to be like, in order to remove all these jobs, which may or may not happen, uh, you're going to see it show up like that. So it's a minimum efficacy. I still use it every day. We still use specifically ChatGPT. James uses it in the back end uh, to assist with development projects in the back end of the site. I use it, if not every day, then every other day for, it's a web browser. There's no other way to say that. Like once you learn how to prompt engineer at a medium basic level, you know the things it can do and the things it can't do. And, and you find the things that it can do that you can't be bothered doing. Like you'll find a chunk of text from a book and you're like, summarize this for, um, for two PowerPoint slides. And it'll do that. And I will use maybe 20% of that, but it's still done it. It's that kind of thing. So, but that's, it's, it's a web browser. It's just reorganizing and, or it's finding and presenting information in a way that's easy for lazy humans to get. That's not nothing. I'm not saying AI is shit. I use it every day and we both pay for licenses <laughs> for uh, chat GPT. So it's not nothing, but that's the year in review, maximum lunacy, minimum efficacy. What I want to do is, which is actually the point of this whole series. I want to give you a magical frame on AI because that informs more than anything else the so-called magical uses for AI. Because even when you say use, and this is why we spent so much time on tool technology, metaphysics, when you say use, it's like, what do you mean by use? A better way is to, I think, begin with what do you think a universe that has magic and AI in it look like? So what is a relational universe that has this technology in it look like? Because then it becomes the same as everything else and you world with these platforms and these tools as and when needed. The conversation can get almost effective altruism basic with magic and AI. It's like, oh, what? So I, we'll come back to you, Rosie the Robot. You're going to have some little chattering robot toy in your magic circle with you. So you have your wand and you have your cup and you have your little Rosie the Robot. And that's how, like, you know what I mean? It's like, what, what, what are we going to use uh, AI for in magic? It's like... With all of these things, start with the whole universe. It's counterintuitively the fastest and easiest place. <laughs> the best and easiest place is not one thing, it's everything. Because how you, the metaphysics of how you land on what one thing is tells you everything about the cosmos anyway. Are you in a relational one or not being the most important part? There are some available magical frames. There's the, I'm calling it the Elon Musk, but the bootloader, this idea that humanity is a bootloader for AI. And that's self-important and idiotic. There's the Ian Malcolm, which is self-important, uh, but with more nuance. And if you're not sure what I mean, we're just gonna go to the tape now. But your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And then we have the I didn't have a, a pithy name for this one, unless it's purple head wildebeest. I don't know. The TikTok socialist or laptop class magical frame. And that's the one, uh, and that's hypocritical and, and idiotic. So the people that are most alarmed at the potential impact of AI on employment are also the ones that happen to have been perfectly okay, okay with working in their home the last several years and, and berating the people that couldn't do that. Uh, going out and about. And those are the jobs they're worried about losing. Now, hilarity of hilarities, as AI moves through the workforce, it's coming for the 
freelancing laptop class first, and it's not coming for the Uber drivers first because those <clears throat> those delivery robots are shit, <laughs> and they will remain shit for a long time. And human life is so cheap under late capitalism that one of those robots is much more expensive right now than oh no, we'll just um, uh, we'll just pay Javier to do it, right? So those are the frames. I think, I hinted at from a relational perspective, there is a more satisfying magical frame. So I'm going to give you another video now. I'm going to give you a discussion between grandmother Ursula, Ursula K. Le Guin, and Donna Haraway. People talking about technology, and they mean the, tech, the, the high technology, the uh, recent advances of the last 50, 60 years, and often of the last 15 or 20 years, and there's this complete obliviousness to the fact that uh, most of the, the, the sort of basic technologies, like, you know, <clears throat> building bricklaying, carpentry, sewing clothes, and so on, these are technologies of great refinement that have been worked on for hundreds of years, and are absolutely gorgeous. And they're just, oh, they, oh you, know, we, you know, they don't count. That's not really technology. But, well, the hell it isn't. And it, I think this is where often science fiction does kind of go wrong hmm. in, in thinking that, that the only good tech is high tech. Hmm. So, you see, to me, in, in, in my line of work, it's a, it's a really useful distinction. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That kind of needs needs repeating and driving home. Mm -hmm. Remember that, you know, a wooden floor is a masterpiece so of I'd engineering. I like to use high technology for acts of domination so that some very ancient controls of, um, let's say, irrigation projects in nation building in ancient worlds uh, that produce structures of domination that astralize the you know, that, that turn the, the, the forces of the earth into the sky gods. Mm -hmm. that, the, certain ways in which very ancient technologies produce the problems we are still living with um, seem to me, it's the technologies that are about uh, the appropriation of value and it's uh, for the high gods, mm -hmm. for the rulers. I want to use high technology more that way. Mm -hmm. rather than um, in relationship to whether it's, say, biomolecular engineering versus carpentry, oh. both of which are technologies. Well, why not just <laughs> call it state technology? Oh. Well, <laughs> because, but that, yeah. it, I think, well, I, and the high low have, is very we need more than one term for these yeah. big things. Yeah, yeah maybe, if, you know, if, it, if this is sort of the, the technology of the high gods, you could call it Jovian or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. mm -hmm. Right. Well, or, ca you know, the word capitalism should make its appearance at a certain point. I believe the word and, capitalism you know, should make its appearance. We need to, to learn this. Yeah, <laughs> instead of just slithering across a month. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's some stuff in that exchange, and you'll have the full video linked up below in the show notes, that I really like. I like making the cut at high technology, so the technology of the sky gods. I like that. Um, there's a, there's a quasi-gnostic read on it. Um, I did note, and this has always been Haraway's problem, and I love her, by the way, but don't get me wrong. Um, she can't use the word state when that was suggested, a Le Guin being, even though she would admit it, an anarchist of sorts. Haraway can't use the word state because she's still a bit too commie to release the word. And that's been backwards and forwards with her and Bruno Latour and so on. It's by the by from here, but it was really interesting to see that she wouldn't, <laughs> she wouldn't budge on like, well, let's just call it state versus non-state technology. By the same token, there's something about high technology or the technology of the sky gods that invites a, a, a frame or an angle that is very useful from a magical perspective. So the Le Guin Haraway edit is how we begin to move our way into how magicians and AI operate and relate in the same cosmos. Here's one, and this is one of the, the main point that I had to do a couple of other episodes and a bunch of premium member stuff. You don't need to have seen the premium member stuff, but it's there. And I wanted to think of what I want to call this. And it's like the agentic Promethean frame. It is a frame of 
we'll just use these as placeholder terms now, humans and technology that is explicitly magical and relational and relies on a few ideas that this is where I was building up to with Ivan Ilich uh, earlier on in this series. He, he talks about the idea of contingency in the sense that, oh, by the way, if you're watching this, which you don't need to, but if you're watching it, you see on the slides, those second two bullet points there, the shift from inherent existence bullet point and the world viewed as grace bullet point were, that's 95% chat GPT. So these are examples. <laughs> Basically, in the 11th to 14th century, there was a shift in the understanding of the world having an inherent, inherent existence. And the way he frames that, he's so good at this, is he'll give you reads on the Greeks, so Aristotle and Plato and so on, that you haven't seen. And the first time he says it, you're like, mm, that's not really in there. But it is. It's not the only thing that's in there. And his point was that in Greek philosophy, the word, Greek philosophy has a metaphysics for the world simply existing. It just, so emanatory, whatever. But it, it just means that the world has come into being. It, and, and thus exists. It has inherent existence. So that's a, a cornerstone of Greek philosophy. The Christians in the 11th to 14th century shifted to something that looks far more Andean to me, which is one of the reasons I vibe with it, I think. The world is continuously created, and that's what the word contingent means. It's literally contingent upon the, the continuous effort of uh, God in keeping this whole enchilada warm the whole time. So it's not one event and then the cosmos is, is running on its various spheres and emanations and so on. It's every millisecond, God is making the decision effectively to keep the cosmos running. And that means every second is a gift because it's God's. Uh, he might switch it off and he will switch it off uh, whenever he feels like it. And so it moves you into a, a gratitudinal frame because every second, like the fact that creation has existed for this one second, it's not obvious that it'll exist for the next. So you move into more of a gratitude position, the world viewed as grace and a gift from an ever-loving creator God. I quite like that. That was a piece that I've, I've been looking for to, uh, to contain uh, in this story because... <clears throat> I would say from a more magical, more relational perspective, there are more beings in the world in the widest sense, let's say the cosmos, the dimensions, whatever, than just the big G. And years ago, I was given this vision of modernity in a scrying session. And it was like, From the, the first electrified lights. So it depends where you put modernity, but this spirit showed me as the, um, the initial electrification, particularly of street lamps at night. <clears throat> the whole modern project was contained within its hands. So all cities, planes, uh, and space time in this way of seeing, which we would say way of relating that we understand that is contingent upon some foundational spells, one of them being electricity. And that came up, which I was thinking about the other day, in the early member Q&As way back in the day, some questions from a late lamented member, whom I still miss in, in Q&As. She was asking about, is electricity something like a power we've stolen from the sky gods? And I was like, no, it's, it's theft from the stone kingdom is what I've been shown in these scrying sessions. Um, it's something that belongs in the stone kingdom that we are extracting. So that's, that's turning, I don't know, coal into this laptop. Uh, and coal, yes, you can say, well, that's plant matter. Thank you. Uh, it, it, it falls under stone governance. Uh, anyway, so why those two things go together is you'll recall in one of the earlier episodes, Matthias de Stefano, um, the Atlantis remembering portal on ayahuasca, doing some thinking with ayahuasca and, and AI and getting the message that now we have awakened basilica so that we have a way of communicating with the mineral kingdom. And that these things are all aligning for me because when you understand modernity as a 
as contingent upon these collection of spells from these beings. You look differently at what we're gaining and what we're losing. So that's the agentic Promethean vision of modernity because it gives you a amoral, literally without recognizable moral anyway, perspective on stuff that's otherwise morally electrifying. But if you look at it as this whole multi-century, two and a half century project, when it's once it's come to its completion, is a form of relating with beings that um, have allowed us or stolen for us some spells from the plant kingdom. And, and the collection of claims that is modernity is like the fingers of this being that we run a temporary civilization in. And so electric lights, I think they began it there because uh, my, uh, one of those um, pro hydrocarbon, Alex Epstein, Alex Epstein uh, says that fossil fuels saved the whales. So it wasn't Greenpeace or anything. It was fossil fuels. And it's true, right? So we used to light street lamps with whale oil. And so Europe needed a lot of whales. And then once we started using hydrocarbons, we stopped hunting the whales. And so the whale population could recover. Similarly, because that one's sort of obvious, the other one is feminism. The, and this is the contingency, the amoral contingency. The technology that was extended to us, through, like in between these fingers, so that we could run a civilization in these cusped hands, is provisional, is contingent. And things can only happen in that kind of relating. And feminism develops from growing female agency in, uh, in a multi-directional sense. It's one of the things that's made it difficult to do deep, I guess, feminist comparison work around the world because you find, for instance, you get to classical Polynesia and it's still, uh, it's still autocratic. It, it, it's still like a monarchical system with no ownership, but women could top the hierarchy and uh, women could own property and vote and so on. Mm. So you've never been able to, it's never really worked. It's like, oh, well, it's still an absolute monarchy, but women can vote. It's like, well, how do I, <laughs> where do I stack this, right? You can't because what's happened is the, the collection of claims of those spells, those modernity making spells that have come through have given like multi-directional agency and optionality to women. And it's a several century project, which reminds me, the other one that comes up, is, and it's why you, if you don't need this framework, it's interesting what happens when you start going relationally and you understand that ideas are some sort of beings. I've mentioned it before in the podcast. I can't find it on YouTube. Someone else might be able to. There's a interview slash interrogation with Camille Paglia in Brazil, I think. It, from memory, it's quite odd. Like, it, like It's almost game show. There's like a white room and these, these two um, female professors are asking her questions and she's answering them and whatever. I don't know. Uh, it's odd. It's about 20 years old, I'd say. And she's talking about how um, trans phenomena are um, evidence for the decadent phase of civilization. And from memory, but if not, this is still, I'm just going to answer this as another question. Like if I misremembered that, I think that's true. But like Camille Paglia, I don't assign a judgment on that. Usually when we think, oh, this is too decadent, there is a, a Victorian morality around that, which is, therefore, we should, I don't know, send all the men off to military academy and blah, 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 right? Oh, we're too decadent. We need to get up and do some star jumps and calisthenics and so on. Um, but it's just what happens now. Like when, because <laughs> Camille Paglia for decades identified as trans anyway. So she's like, it's not. It's not a moral judgment to say that this is evidence. This is just what happens now in the same way that flowers blossom in spring. This phase of civilization we're in, which is decadent, brings these things into being, right? So that um, AI comes as a bridging spell, or it's almost so if you picture those first two hands of this being that we've run civilization in, they're almost playing, which is very Le Guin and very Haraway, actually, a string game. So there's like another hand <laughs> that's coming in now, which contains uh, an AI component to it. There'll be other stuff, but this game 
that we're playing uh, with these collection of ideas and spells and techniques that began with allowing women to move their bodies at night in ways that they hadn't been able to in this particular formulation has led us here. And again, that looks like, ah, oh, that's why we, we should keep women in the kitchen. It's like, no, it's, that's how spells work. And that's what contingency is. We, we world with other ideas and with other beings. This is the agentic Promethean frame that is overarching uh, a way into technology that is uh, sense-making and that is uh, that pulls you forward into different arrangements and partnerships, thus birthing something new. So it's a it's a welding and and relating forward into the future, an agentic Promethean frame. So that's where we're at. I was showing this years ago, and so that's my read on it. It's like modernity is is a string game made up with these like archon finger archon fingers pushed into our space time and we just kind of live <laughs> in the middle of it and i do believe this is why i think i'm so resonant with the hospicing modernity idea each time we do that and it's not one after the other right that's what's so good about a relating frame it's that we will be in relation with others as this happens but each time we do that we must fall to that what is mine to do component of like, well, what are we taking with us? <laughs> what are we taking with us to the next one? What learnings and medicines from this string game are we incorporating into the one or more string games that we're moving into next? That's, I think, the... Uh, the magical frame that has the most charge and the most possibility of relating and welding into something usefully novel, which is what I suggest we do with it, more or less become hybrid. When it comes to AI, um, or just in general, like count off on, in your head, count off all the things that you know that have been unmade, right? Like, I'll wait. Uh, it's here, <laughs> this is what's happening. You become hybrid or you get swamped. And that's not just with AI, because there is no world. There is no extant world. There is no you here and the world there. We are the world welding. So becoming hybrid is to attend upon the things that happen in the world are also the things that happen to you because it is just welding. That's just what there is. And I think, you know what? I think we're getting better at it. And I don't just mean magicians, although I do think we are getting better at it, the good ones anyway. Um, the pain of Gaza is, is so alive because we're hybrid. It is happening. We're welding. It's we're actually getting better at it. And I'll tell you, I think this is the main medicine of that last iconic string game is to have come out of two and a half centuries, beginning with electric or even whale light, really, that allowed women to relate um, to each other and to men in uh, novel cultural categories. I think the main medicine, and this is my guess that we take out of the previous string game, is understanding the difference between uh, technology as a proxy for relating and connection and technology as a platform for facilitating authentic relating and connection. Because I've spoken about this before, but if you think of the, in just a few decades we've had the internet, we... Uh, we built a way of messaging, and then we built early social networks like MySpace, and that um, that Gen X desktop publishing '90s vision, utopian future of oh we'll all live in this like digital reality where everyone can be happy and express each other. And it turns out it's just military tech that um, makes American teenagers think they're birds. Like it's a mess, right? Uh, and now we're at this stage where it's like, oh, well, there's a mess. So what do we do? Do we stop using it? No, it's not that because you don't really unmake stuff. But having learned that, tech, that, that the tool does not replace the action, 
then we're better positioned and you can't describe it. You can just do it. We're in a better position to use technologies to platform authentic connecting. And I think a, a, one of the first parts, one of the first fingers of this new string game that's coming in, and by first, I mean, probably not in our lifetimes, although who knows, is, and I wrote about this recently. When you do something, when you're in a group Zoom call, a group Zoom intention or so on, it's not happening in the Zoom room. It's happening at the level of the field, particularly if like we do for the membership, like you actually spend time attending upon and getting in resonance with the field. I think the next string game is going to demonstrate the reality of our actions primarily being pointed to what we're currently calling the field one way or the other. So that we, it's not so much that we'll have a Zoom that works at the level of the field. It's that our awareness of the field will inform how we develop uh, technologies and platforms of relating. So this is the now you've awakened the silica moment, because if you think of silica and its crystalline form, that's what, that's what I get whenever I tune into it. That's a few centuries off, so you don't need to do that. That's if you're taking notes. <laughs> right, okay. Build a Zoom based on the principles of the field. Done, what's next? Um, becoming hybrid with what's going on in the world. AI is, if you haven't used it, if, and it doesn't matter, like whatever, um, you might be a blacksmith. I met one the other day. If, and actually now I can think of what she could use, <laughs> what she could use Shed GPT for, it doesn't matter. You, have, you could have zero interest in it. You could, and this is more than valid, like no, I am minimizing all screens. I have certain intentions to do as little that is digitally facilitated as possible. I get you. But if you're listening to this, AI is part of your magical practice, at least on the level of some of the podcasts you listen to are constructed with the addition of AI, with the use of AI, which this is one of them, right? Uh, so this is a show about magic and it's your magical practice and it was made with the assistance of AI tools. So we keep coming back to the metaphysics of tools, which has been the, the shift in this whole series it is looking at Instead of intelligence, which reminds me, one of the best books that I read last year, the author of one of the best books I read last year, James Bridal, was on the uh, Emergence Magazine podcast talking specifically about intelligence in an AI context. And so an excellent discussion. You'll have that in the show notes. If I've forgotten, somebody ping me and, and put it in because I was listening to that on the drive up to uh, record, as you can see, I'm out of my house if you're watching it, on the drive up to record this episode. So if you do want to deep dive on intelligence as a concept and how it interfaces with AI, that's the one for you. But we spend a lot of time on artifice, on, on the metaphysics of tool. What is artificial, you know? So that's where we come back to when we become hybrid. And in particular, boy, this is like OG era uh, premium membership Q&A material. But Rain Willislev, his research, anthropologist, uh, his research amongst the Yuka gear on shape-shifting. Uh, myself and the uh, late lamented uh, departed member would have some long conversations uh, about this because I think, and she did too, the, the cultural fault lines around the trans phenomena um, only exist in a materialist worldview, <laughs> right? Uh, when you understand shape-shifting as a human and not just human capacity, things start to look very different. Anyway, I'm just going to quote from, oh no, this is another chat GPT bit. I asked for a summary of uh, Rain Rilislev's research among the Yuka gear and they sexed it up a bit. Shapeshifting in shamanic practices is not just a symbolic or metaphorical act. You can tell ChatGPT wrote that because I would have smacked the just off because symbolic and metaphorical, metaphorical, they're assuming we're using that the same way. And I can promise you, I am not using the word metaphor the same way as ChatGPT. But a way of knowing and interacting with the world. It represents a cognitive process where the shaman genuinely experiences the world from the perspective of another being, whether an animal, spirit, or another entity. So it's not a symbolic or metaphorical act. You don't just put the horns on. Uh, you, particularly when it comes to hunting, 
Um, hunters and they've got mentally become their prey. Again, I, I'm going to put, it's funny that they put speech marks around become when I would have put it around mentally because it's contingent upon th theory of mind. doesn't matter. Empathetic hunting practices. Hunters mentally become their prey to understand and predict behavior, blending human consciousness with animal perception. So when I say become hybrid and talk about AI, but before we get to it, the ontological reality of shape-shifting is, is quite important. For um, Willis Lev, uh, shape-shifting should be understood as an ontological reality, not just as psychological or hallucinatory experience. The shaman's experience of transforming into other beings are real within their cultural and ontological frameworks. And I was about to quibble with that, because, but, which is true. It's just that I would also quibble with the, the framework that uses terms like cultural and ontological frameworks. But it's nevertheless true. This perspective challenges Western notions of objective reality and invites a broader understanding of what constitutes reality across different cultures. So from an animism and personhood perspective, Willis Lev's thesis ties into broader discussions of animism, particularly the idea that non-human entities, animals, plants, objects, possess personhood and agency. Shape-shifting, in this view, is a way of acknowledging and engaging with the personhood of non-human entities. So to become hybrid, is to have sufficient, to extend sufficient personhood outside of the human. And I, I, that strikes me as a respect move. But to do so as a form of knowledge making, if you actually, and you should, Willis Love stuff's great. Uh, shape shifting is knowledge making because the shaman becomes a raven or becomes a bear, or what have you, and or a prey animal, but what have you. The prey animal one makes sense. You become that to, um, to operate and understand what, is, what are the value signals coming from the environment for that particular prey animal, so you know they're going to be over there that day, or what have you. But it's, especially if you spend time with them, it's knowledge making in a deeper level. Like, what does the bear know that we don't? So we come back with knowledge that would not have happened because of how we're shaped, because we can become hybrid with other beings. That, if we've awakened the silica, is useful to sit with. Now, should you, having just said that about Larry Summers and digital currencies and so on, shape shift into chat GPT? I wouldn't. Uh, but this frame of experiencing the world where humans, one of the things we can do, one of, in fact, our uh, powerful capacities, which we don't share with many other nations, like Bear can do it and so on, to be able to shape shift, to be able to knowledge make by moving form. Well, this is, this is something to sit with to open end to leave open, to leave, to invite change and transformation and novelty and new insight and new configurations when it comes to something like AI. Because, you know, it might have been, all things are, overhyped, underdelivered in its first couple of years. It's, it's about, ChatGPT is functional and in the public for about 18 months. So we're past that one year mark. And we're also past the low hanging fruit, which is, it is frankly a better way of doing two-thirds of what I would use a search engine for. Uh, and it is not just worse at that final third, it is actively unhelpful. <laughs> That's the weird thing about it, right? It's so, it's so much better than, say, Google at two-thirds of the research-based things that I would use it for. But the one-third, and it'll trip you up, uh, the one-third that Google's better at, it's not that ChatGPT is worse. It's not the difference between Google and Bing. It's the difference between Google and this is actively false information sending me in the wrong direction. <laughs> hey, you know, you head out into the hunting ground, you get what you get. But that's what, like, if shape-shifting if shape -shifting has an ontological reality, and I believe it does, and I did, in fact, see someone shape-shift into a jaguar in the jungle the first time I went, but even if I hadn't, it's ontological reality, we are, it's ontological reality is inviting us to sit with what an awakened silica model of AI looks like for uh, hybrid and so on. 
what's next? Uh, <laughs> this, it's going to be an interesting birth or an interesting handover in between string game hands. Because we're, and I'm, pr I'm probably falling into it now. I'm, in fact, I'm sure I am. The classic trap of overestimating the short-term impact and underestimating the long-term impact. I think that the long-term impact in the next 12 months will be to the principal touch point between most humans and AI over the next 12 months will be a growing out of what we've seen now, the um, the prompts, the, the reply prompts in eBay and so on, and a cleaning up and smoothing out of a whole bunch of friction-filled digital processes in that regard. So you will land on a uh, a travel booking page, so a flight uh, a flight aggregator, and they are very useful, but they're awful, as you're aware. They won't be awful by the end of next year. Uh, You'll just be like, hey, I want to do this. I need to, I'll just, you just me. I, I need to go from Hobart to, to Lima, uh, flying one world for points reasons. Uh, I need to overnight in Sydney on the way back. And I also need to overnight in Santiago on the way there. What are the options? I'm flexible with travel dates anytime February 2024. That's what it's going to do. But see, that's not. Oh my God, the robots are here, right? That's like, well, you've turned a shit website into a website that was a pleasure to use because I will eventually get those details out of the flight aggregator and so on. I'll eventually get it. It's just garbage and friction beforehand. So I think that's the principal touch point moving forward. In the right hands, which is to say nerds, I'm expecting far more dramatic stuff. So uh, unfortunately, uh, YouTube in particular, it was it's already awash with faceless channels, but you will be able to create faceless channels and faceless videos with, uh, you can have Barack Obama narrating your uh, how-to video to paint birds. Right? There's a large picture of birds. There's a large painting of birds. And so, <laughs> birds behind me, you can't see it <laughs> in the kitchen. It's kind of nice. Well done, Barack. But in the right hand, you're going to see in the next 12 months something very impressive. Like, a collection of very impressive things. You'll probably see your first AI-generated feature film and go, well, that was bad, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Generally speaking, it's just going to be making garbage processes a little bit better. No one, well, hopefully we can get rid of the, the perennially tweeting. But other than that, um, that's where I see it going. Now, the wild cards, of course, uh, when you start putting central bankers on the board of uh, OpenAI, as we move into the year, we get a CBDC proper, like a retail CBDC. Uh, it might be different. The, the, this is plainly part of that wider play of building out a global digital currency that uh, is. So let me back it up. So this is in 2024. This is 2025 at the earliest. But why central bankers are interested in AI is the programmable currency is not just, although it is this in the first instance, to stop you from having any kind of joy or agency in your life with regards to animal protein or travel. They don't want any of that for you. They want you dead, but they don't want any of that for you. But the when you go to these meetings with psychopaths, and I have, not WEF meetings, but even at a senior media and policy level when so-called big data was coming through, they talk complete fantasies that cannot exist technically in reality yet. And then they turn around to their nerds and say, oh, you know, big data is coming. We're doing this. It's like, well, we can't build any. You just said things that aren't real. One of the things that currently isn't real is for these digital currencies to be intelligent enough to not just recognize that um, you can't buy meat or you cannot go to Florida because you went last year. They need to be able to recognize, oh, you haven't had sufficient sulforaphane. You haven't had sufficient um, greens today based on your purchases. So it's going to recommend, and I mean, I'm sure they promise in the utopian heads even for it to be free, that like go into the nearest Whole Foods and get free broccoli, right? Chat GPT can sort, no, it can't sort of do that. But by the end of next year, it's, if you give it that, oh, well, a human needs 
uh, a human meal needs 2,300 calories a day. It needs to come from this and this and this. And all those purchases are going through a digital currency. That's actually a very easy mesh, right? So it's the predictive part of our coming prison. I don't see that happening in uh, 2024. Uh, I do see it happening in 2025. Uh, in, yeah, the 2025 to 2026 range, and then it's war, and then it's the end of those kind of currencies. But so I might be wrong that, in fact, we can get that next year. <laughs> we will certainly find out why the the epicenter of tyranny, of technocratic tyranny, is like, right, I'm on the board of this cutesy nonprofit. We've kicked out the effective altruist lunatics, and we've put the prime minister of hell on the board. So there'll be, I, I'm not ruling out crazy wild cards in the AI world in that direction, because... Larry Summers is evidence that that's plainly the direction at least part of this development is going. And it just takes a couple of clever nerds to, to build that out and all of a sudden it's ready. So programmable currency and AI will look like that. Programmable currency will come first, which is you're just, there's just caps, they're just quotas on the things that you get. The customizable stuff will be, especially as it's related to devices that internet of bodies, blah, blah, blah. It's like you need to walk. 8,000 more steps before you can buy another chocolate. This is as stupid as that. Like, they are building that. Uh, will it... Will we finally get up off the couch and grab our walking sticks and toddle over to our rascals and, I don't know, J6 all over again before that happens? Hey. <laughs> the space weather could go either way on that. Uh, but that's where that's barreling. And there's a video in the premium members area, depending on when this episode comes out, to do with where you locate your points of consent and departure with what's, what the world is doing over the next couple of years, because it's foregone. It, it's going to happen. I've been saying this since 2020, and I continue to be right. But now we're at the pointy end of it. So... This is a reason to become hybrid because if you become hybrid, if you don't become hybrid, you'll become bored. I should have put that in as a slide. That's actually true and clever. So that's what's next. Uh, the other thing that is the other wild card in the opposite direction is in the next three to five years is the time frame where it is most likely we will lose either all or great chunks of the internet to war, to EMPs, and so on. I don't think we get out of this World War III period without losing chunks of the internet from at least an EMP perspective. Nukes will do the same thing. In fact, a nuke in upper atmosphere is an EMP, but I, it's plainly obvious that, and you know, these people are psychotic enough to do it as a false flag because they spent the last three years saying, oh, China or Russia might use an EMP to take out the North American internet or grid. Yeah, they might, but also once this chat GPT CBDC style combination system is ready to go, they might flip the switch on it themselves. So one way or the other, I think we lose chunks of the internet between now and then. That, if it's not a, a classic false flag, if it just happens as a course over the course of a war, then that's the thing that's going to um, push the timelines on the rollouts and developments of what AI is going to do. But if we Again, stay up at that like high level, becoming hybrid, uh, relational cosmos. It invites us into different places of intervention so that we don't have to be like, oh, right, CBDCs are coming. I'm going to hoard gold. That's not the takeaways, first of all, silver. That's not the takeaways of this presentation. This presentation is. for actually magical people who understand that the cosmos is a community of beings relating and it's doing a bunch of stuff <laughs> for the next few years. That is, from my perspective, has more bad than good in it. But we, it's, it's what we're doing. And the relational model invites you to uh, find places of intervention and points of consent and departure that look different than if you just kind of go binary on it. Which brings us to cheat, which brings us back to Maggie Thatcher. What a weird way to end this. Uh, there'll probably be a series two because AI is here. 
Uh, but what a weird place to end <laughs> series one, AI for magicians. Experience AI as a tool companion rather than an intelligence. So if you have, and if you do magic, you've probably got one or two of them, but a tool being. So it, on the one hand, it does one thing, but it does it with personality and a curious sense of unreliability and relationality. I have a couple of tools for shamanic healing that are like that. Some lessons or some uh, clients, they'll want to be used. Other clients, they were like, no, take me off the board, quite literally. Uh, and what happens, this is earlier on in the series, when you use a tool, a magical tool in particular. So the, the first hunters and spears, where did the hunter begin and end with the spear? Does the spear extend you as a being? Is it a separate being? Are you hybrid at that point? That's where you want to go with AI. Is, is a tool companion rather than an intelligence. And I think that's enough of a frame break to, to get magicians kind of uh, in there a bit more. Particularly, speaking of the Hunter's Tool, uh, years ago, the last presentation I gave at the London Occult Conference, days before I left London, was called Campfire's Edge. It's in the members area, bonus member material, probably way at the beginning, because <laughs> it's a few years ago now. <laughs> But this idea of extending co-creation further into the imaginal, right? So the edge of the campfire is where the human capacities and spirit capacities uh, overlap, like a mangrove swamp. And fire itself is a gift from these beings. So returning to that idea of the fingers and modernity, the whole, uh, this campfire's edge is another one. So the campfire, like one of those earliest techno, that's Luciferian, that's like uh, Promethean. That's, we will give you this capacity and you will dwell at the edges of its light, right? That's the tool companion shapeshift hybrid combination that you're invited to explore with something like this. Where are your touch points? Because this is another thing uh, for the magically operant who listened to the show, are like, okay, cool. Well, I do magic and I haven't fucked around with ChatGPT at all. What should I do now? Like, ask it planetary correspondences for Mars. It's, well, I tried that a couple of times early on. Uh, verify, speaking of Reagan. No, the best thing to do is to find where it interfaces with your life already and optimize so that if you like cooking, if you like trying new recipes and so on. Get good at uh, prompt engineering for recipe creation and so on. And yes, you're going, that's still magic, blah, blah, blah. It is. It's more about experiencing where you begin and a powerful tool ends, phrasing. And so if you paint or if you... Uh, if it's your responsibility to run some fairly complex spreadsheets at work, wherever it's interfacing in your life, interface there first and understand, because that's like your home ground, you know? Understand what it can and can't do. I would, I would actually recommend that. And you'll, you'll begin to understand what you guys can do together. And then if it is required in an explicitly magical direction, I haven't used it in an explicitly magical direction. I use it for, I suppose, research for, magical books and so on, but not, um, <laughs> hey, Larry Summers, give me some ideas for an Astaroth ceremony this coming Friday. The moon's in a good sign for it. Maybe I will. <laughs> uh, go in that direction because the, the, the medicine is in the hybridity rather than the capacity. So find where it's going to be of most use for you and lean in there rather than sit around waiting for it to be useful for whatever magic is as a separate thing in your life. Allow it to contribute to your welding. That's where we finish the talk. Because it is already contributing to your welding. So it's for you to attend upon that process, allow it to contribute to your welding and find what is yours to do and what is AI's to do as we do all of this.